the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before you. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. So open up the gates, make way before the king. Surely my God 
defends me. Your love defends me. And when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me. Your love defends me. Surely
right, choir's coming down. Shake hands, hug next. Let folks know you're glad to see them in church today. And hi, everybody. Glad you're with us. I'm Carlton Duck, pastor of Yosemite Baptist Church right here in the beautiful Lynchburg, Virginia, in the heart of Lynchburg, one block off of Lakeside Drive. We're near the main entrance to Lynchburg College. Stay tuned for the message today. You know, we live in a world that's dysfunctional. We live in a world that's got flaws. My gosh, it's just a mess. But I'm glad that we've got a God that can turn all of that around today. I want you to stick with me today in the pages of God's Word. We're going to be back in Genesis today in Genesis 27. And I pray that the Word of God will find a place in your heart that will transform and change you to His glory. Maybe you're living in a state of dysfunction and flaws. I'm telling you today, God can turn it all around. He has a victory for you. We appreciate you tuning in. Continue to pray for us as we're praying for you. And again, I want to extend to you an invitation to come experience this great church that God is mightily using, Gethsemane Baptist Church. You'll find the people friendly, the word is preached, and it's a great place to bring your family that you can enjoy. God bless you today. Enjoy the worship, and may his word touch your heart today. Praise the Lord. We're going to go back and sing a chorus, give you time to get back to your seat. 
And uh, we're going to sing one more chorus through. Sing it with us. Lift your voices and give God glory. Amen. Oh, victory. Give the Lord a praise in the house of the living God. Amen. Dysfunction. Have you noticed that within our society, our culture, in every realm, area, opportunity, place, time, we're hearing this term dysfunction or dysfunctional more and more. Now they label kids in school that they have learning issues and problems and they call it dysfunctional. 
uh, we, we see it happening within the confines of, of our lives, our kids, our homes, our families, in every area of our living that we, we're associated or connected with. It seems like this has become a common term or word that has become somewhat prevalent in our society. Dysfunction. And uh, we're going to deal with that today. Because God is Lord over dysfunction. Amen. So you don't have to accept today what they say because it's become a place that you throw blame. It's a place that you lay the cause at. Well, it's dysfunction. You know, they, they can't or they have. Listen, folks. God has a cure for everything. And we should desire and want what God has for us today. I am back in the book of Genesis. I am, let's try that again. You're supposed to say amen. I am back in the book of Genesis. I heard that too. Genesis 27, we're going to only use verses 1 through 13 today, and I want to begin this morning by making a statement to you that you shouldn't forget. God sees potential in people, even flawed people. Now, you notice the progression of music today and what we use by Mercy Me, that song about flawless, the transition and things that happened. You know, God is a God of transition in our life, isn't he? I mean, he transitions us, he transforms us from what we used to be into what he desires for us to be. So it's a process of transformation that God works. That's why we use 2 Corinthians 5.17. I'm glad God sees in us today not just what we are at that moment, but he sees great potential in our flaws of life. So Jesus began with 12 flawed people. All his disciples were flawed. Every one of them had imperfections. Every one of them had sins. Every one of them were marred. Every one of them had a place of dysfunction in their life. But we all come to the Lord in those positions today, and we come flawed, we come, we come to him damaged, we come to him in need of repair, but the good news is God can still use you. God can change your life today. God can turn things around for you today. But you've got to participate in doing what God wants done in your life. Today, we return to the book of Genesis for a while, and we'll be doing some other things. I'm just, you know, I don't try to be too heavy on you. I'll hit some things, and then we'll go to something else, and then we'll come back to it. I just keep trying to refresh you in God's Word, and I've really been trying to preach to you through this year and the latter part of last year. In a, in a position of where God wants you to be in the transition that he wants to work in your life to use you mightily for his kingdom. And so we, we're going to focus and pick up today with Genesis 27. And in, in respect of God and his word today, let's stand for the reading of God's word. Please, if you would. And, uh, and we, we start today, and the Bible says, And it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim, so that he could not see, he called Esau, his eldest son, and said unto him, My son, and he said unto him, Behold, here am I. And he said, Behold, now I am old, I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver and thy bow, and go out to the field, and take me some venison. He said, I want you to fix me something to eat, and make me a savory meat, such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. And Rebekah heard what Isaac spake unto Esau. She had her ear firmly pressed against the door and heard exactly because she had an ulterior motive. And Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob, her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau, thy brother, saying, Bring me venison and make me savory meat that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord, uh, before, and, and before the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. She said, Just do it, boy. Amen. Go now to the flock, fetch me from thence two good kids of the goats, 
And I will make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth. That was his favorite dish. And thou shalt bring it to thy father, that he may eat, and that he may bless thee before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man. <laughs> and I am smooth man. Well, they called him Harry as a... No. <laughs> anyway, verse 12. My father peradventure will feel me, and I shall see, him, see to him as a deceiver, and I shall bring a curse upon me and not a blessing. And his mother said unto him, Upon me be thy curse, my son. Only obey my voice and go fetch me them. May God bless the reading of his word today. You may be seated. Honestly, this is a very pathetic story in the Bible, if you think about it. Here we have Isaac, Jacob, and their families. Here we have a situation that seemingly there's some things going on that's not God-honoring and will not bring a blessing. Well, you may know this family. <laughs> On the outside, it seems they have it all together. You ever seen people like that? I mean, they have all the right words. They have all the right look. They have all the right smell. Everything about them we seemingly is right. But behind closed doors, that good-looking church-going family is nothing but a wreck. There's nothing right with them. I mean, they put on the image, they put on the face, they put on the facade. Everything looks good, but behind that is just basically rotten to the core. Well, Isaac the father is totally unplugged. Rebecca the mother, she smiles a lot. But behind that smile is a manipulative, manipulative deceitful woman. I got to use that word some more, so I better get it right. Manipulative. Thank you, Lord. This couple has two boys. Twin boys, as a matter of fact. Jacob and Esau. Now, Esau is rebellious. He's spiritually obtuse, meaning that he's a little dull and slow. He's just not, re not responsive to what God wants to do. Esau connected well with Isaac, the father. So... In today's language, Esau liked, let's put it in a term you can understand. Esau was a type today that would like fast cars and fast women. That was kind of his niche. That's what he liked. That's the way he liked to live. So then there's Jacob. Jacob is what we would call a mama's boy. Tommy? I'm just kidding. I couldn't resist that one. Amen. I was a mama's boy too. It's all right. Nothing wrong with that. Amen. He's mammy's boy. He's mammy's boy. All right. That's even better. But let's look at Jacob for a moment because Jacob, really, his name means he's a trickster. However, Jacob, and this is really ironic because here is the trickster, the shyster, the everything else that you can think negative to call him, but he is the chosen one. Now, that doesn't make any sense. Really, if you look at Genesis 27 in the context and you try to apply it in today's society, it will boggle your mind. But you've got to look beyond that and see what God's trying to speak to you because through the line of Jacob would come the Messiah, Jesus, the Redeemer of the world, amen. But in this story, Jacob is like everyone else. Just typical in today's environment. This story in Genesis, we find it has uniqueness to it because all of us in this room are somehow, some place, some area, we are in this story. What? Yep. Every one of us, we're in this story. So you say, well, preacher, I got to see that. Well, I will. I'll show it to you. But you've got to look at today in the areas of living today that we are in and we find ourselves, you've got to see just not where you are now, but you've got to see the end of the story. And this is what you've got to see. God still does what he says he's going and says that he's going to do. 
So God, what he declares and what he says is going to happen. So actually, this passage is, it could be encouraging for you and I today because if you've got a messed up family, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but if you, <laughs> I thought I'd get one out of you on that. If you got a mess, oh, I'm hearing it all now. Oh, Lord, I'm seeing two hands raised and amen and oh, Lord, and everything else. Help me, Jesus. I can see people almost pulling out the handkerchief and wiping their brow. But if you've got a messed up family, guess what? You are not alone. Right, amen. Just look around the room. <laughs> it's just a whole bunch of us in here got messed up families. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. You say, well, preacher, what can be good about that? It just means that you're a good candidate for what God can do. There's only one family in the Bible today that really is, is not dysfunctional. And that is the family of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And today I want you to know something. If you've got a messed up family, you can know that God is not done with you yet. God's not done with me, nor is he done with you. Hallelujah. God is still in the miracle working business. He's in the business of turning lives and families around. He's in the business of saving souls. He's in the business of still blessing people. He's in the blessing business today of doing today that is beyond your comprehension, my understanding, or anything that we can even think today because that's the God who we serve. He can do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think according to the power that works in you and I today. What is that power? It's the power of Jesus Christ. It's the power of the blood, the power of the cross. This is what our God can do. But you've got today to, you've got to submit yourself to this God who can do this work in your life. So let's make, let's, let's make it a little bit closer. Let's get a little bit closer to this. Maybe today we said that we talked about dysfunctional families. Maybe you're the dysfunctional one. I didn't get too many amens on that one. I didn't get too many old me's. I didn't get too many old lords. Help me, Jesus. I sure, Lord, didn't see no hands raised. You got to get this today. Dysfunction does not mean, dysfunction does not mean disqualification. Amen. Actually, you are qualified for God to do something awesome in your life today. He wants to bless you. Amen. So get this today, the, the God of the Bible, the God in whom we believe in today is the God of redemption. And he is the God today that saves people through the blood of Jesus Christ. You're either here in one of two conditions. You're either here saved or you're here lost. There's no in between. It's not you trying to slide in or trying to get in or trying to cross your fingers and hope you make it thing. It's the fact that you either are or you're not. You're either a child of God or you're not a child of God. You're either saved or you're not saved. You're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. So the question is, which one are you? I tell you, I'm glad I'm a blood-washed, born-again child of the king. Amen. So how'd you get there? I gave Jesus my heart and my life and I asked him to forgive me my sins and come into my heart and life and save me. And on the authority of God's word, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I did that. Have you done that? If you haven't done that, then why haven't you done it? Are you really going to continue to gamble with your life and think that you're going to get through and maybe somehow, some way, God's going to have mercy on you? The mercy is now, friend. You've got to cry out for God's mercy right now. God be merciful to me, a sinner. And I'm glad when you make that plea before God, God responds instantaneously. He responds with his grace. And I'm glad for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Then there's another point to this. If you think you have missed God's will for your life, you know what? You're wrong. It's not too late for you to get in the will of God. I want to tell you today, you think you're blessed, you're not blessed yet. The more you get into the will of God, the more blessed you're going to be. The more you walk with Jesus and his cadence and his direction, his leadership, the more blessed your life is going to be. Well, preacher, I'm just trying to hang on and get through. Listen, you need to discard that, throw that stuff out. That's the mentality of the world. That's not the mentality of a blood-washed Christian today who has the authority of God's word on their side. God tells us today who we are, that he'll abundantly bless you today, but you've got to yield yourself, you've got to submit yourself, you've got to commit yourself to what God wants to do in your life. If you really want the blessings of God, it's going to come at a cost. He's already paid the cost. 
You say, well, what's my cost? It's a cost of submission, of letting God have his way in your life today. And you think, well, I've messed up. I've, I've totally, I've just really squandered my life somewhat. It's not too late. God can change your life. He can change everything about you today. So what God, really, what is God's will for you today? You think about that. Well, I found this in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 3. For it says, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. you got to be sanctified. Well, that's a nice word. What does it mean? It means you got to be set apart for God's will. That means you got to cooperate. That means you're going to have to want what God wants for you, even when it's not convenient, and even at times when it may cause difficulty in your life. You've got to realize God is too great. He has never made a mistake, and he will bring you through whatever you're facing, and he will bring you to the results that he desires for you, and that means he's got something far better for you than you could ever think that you've got for yourself. Amen. Amen. So God's will for you is, God's will, here it is, let me give it to you. Let me just lay it right out. We're not going to go point one, point two, point three. We're not going to go through all the little points and the bullets and the check marks and everything else. We're going to get right to the heart of the issue today of what God wants for you. Really, what does God's desire for you today? What does God want to do in your life? What is the priority of God? What is the focus of God? What is God seeking to make you today? What he's trying to do is he wants you and I today to become more like Jesus. Amen, preacher. I preach long when people don't say amen. I feel like you must really need it, so I got to preach longer to get you to the point. God. <laughs> and the church said. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I kind of had a feeling that was going to happen. In this story, there is no one innocent. In this room right now, there's no one innocent. In this world, there's no one innocent. Oh, boy. Now, listen. Through, through all of the cheating and all of the lying and, and in spite of all of that, you know what God then does? God accomplishes his will. And all those schemes of your life that you've been involved in, all those things that has happened to you, all those situations that you faced, God's will will be accomplished. Amen. Amen. Do you know today that God's will is to accomplish today? It will be accomplished. And you know how it's done? It's accomplished through all of us. Because you know what we are? We are flawed people. We have flaws. Now, you may think, well, man, I'm the best thing since white sliced bread. I'm all that, a Coke on the side and a bag of Lay's chips, too. No, you're not. You may eat that, and you may think you're that, but you ain't that. Bad English, sorry. The fact of the matter is, man, you and I are in need today of a God today. So realizing that today, God is going to accomplish his will through flawed people like you and I. Why does God then work through flawed people? Why does God choose to do that? It's, it's exactly what Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. It shows us that the power and the perfections and the praise and all the glory all belongs to God. God wants your life to be a living testimony to his glory. And as you pursue to be in this image of Jesus, come on, listen to me now. When you really pursue Christ, when you really desire him, when you really go after him, when you become a God chaser, I'm going to tell you what, God will work that in your life. You've got to abandon the world. You've got to push aside what you want. You've got to lay aside all your desires and your goals and everything else. These are all substandard to what God has for you today. He's got a higher way, a greater way, a blessed way, amen. So why are you accepting today the ways of the world and the thoughts of the world and the pattern of the world when God's got something far better for your life? When you submit to God, his will, desire him, and to be in the image of Christ, God then will perform his will in you, and you're going to be blessed beyond measure, amen. Because that's what God desires to do in your life. So here's the theme of the message. Well, first it kind of reminds me today that in the story in Genesis 27, 
I see something that really, really is a headliner here. I see those two words, sin abounding. I see the progression in the scriptures that we read. I just saw one thing after another, kind of like what our lives dictate. But in the New Testament, it declares, oh man, this is really awesome. Where sin did abound, his grace did much more abound. Where your sins and my sins and our flaws and our dysfunction today abounded, thank God his grace abounded greater than. So here's the theme of the message. God's grace is greater than all our sins. Amen. See, this is one of the things that's missing in the church today. We want hype, but we want holiness. We want to hear about how I can get and how I can do and all these things today. We want to pump, pump, pump up the flesh. But man, we're totally ignoring and we're starving the spirit in us. We're not really taking the tools that God has put in his word to develop us to be the Christians that God's called us to be. Well, you're going to hear what you need to hear here. You're going to hear the word of God. I didn't come to throw out hype to make your flesh feel good and make your hair stand up on end. I've come to give you Jesus this morning. And I'm telling you right now, he'll do far more for you than you could ever do for yourself. And when you submit and you commit yourself to him, you'll see God do a mighty work in your life. Thank God that God's grace is greater than all of our sins today. Amen. That should be today a hallmark of our Christianity. The first point is this, and they're very short today. And these are kind of pointed points today, if you would. It is a sin to be bullheaded. Now, I'm sure some of you ladies have called your husband, old bullhead. And the lady said, and that's weak, 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 weak. The first man that we see in this passage is a man by the name that we know about him that came from, of course, Abraham and Sarah. His name is Isaac. And you know, the way that he came about is a miracle within itself. But Isaac knows, and here we are in the latter places of his life, and he knows he's going to die. Before he goes, he wants to give his last will and testament. And so he wants to give his blessings to his oldest son, Esau. And that was the custom of that day. If you look back in the history uh, books, you'll see that basically that's the way it worked. So in Genesis 25, God had spoken to Rebekah. Here's what it said in verse 23. And the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb, and two manners of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. So Jacob, not Esau, was supposed to get the inheritance. Jacob was supposed to receive the inheritance. Now, you say, yeah, but man, this, this whole family is tainted with dysfunction. This whole family is flawed. Oh, don't be so quick to look at their family. We better look at our own families today. We need to look at our own lives. We too are tainted with dys dysfunctionality. We too have flaws. We too are imperfect. We too have missed the mark. We too are sinners. We too need help. Amen. So, Isaac knew that, knew that, he knew what the custom was in that day, but Isaac becomes bullheaded. Isaac is playing favorites with Esau. Isaac was basically ruled by his desires, and you better watch that. So what is Isaac doing? Well, he does four things. One, today, he's ignoring God's word. I'm going to tell you, you're going to get in trouble when you ignore what God's word says. When God tells you, you better watch out for sin, you better watch out for Satan, you better do that. God tells us today, listen, the soul that sinneth shall what? Surely die. When you ignore what God's word is and you don't receive Christ as your savior today, you know what? You are dooming yourself. You're condemning yourself. You have rejected Christ and you're going to wind up in hell because you would not absorb what God's word has said. All that will come to me, I'll in no wise cast out. So therefore today, he ignored the word. Folks, if you today are ignoring the word, don't tell me God's blessing you because there's no way that that's happening. God honors his word. God will not contradict what he says. God will honor what he declares. Second today, he's ruled by his desires. You say, yeah, but remember the psalmist said, God will give you the desires of your heart when it matches the will of God. But he's not going to give you the desires of your life, or your heart, or what you want. God's not about giving you what you want because what you want is always lower than what God's got for you, which is higher. Read Isaiah 55. Third thing is, he is playing favorites. 
He is trying to manipulate. He's trying to do the wrong thing here. He's being bullheaded. So he's trying to play favorites with Esau. And then fourth, he's ignoring the fact that Esau is not qualified. So then he is basically altering the plan, and he was absolutely trying to go a different route, which was not the will of God. So Isaac yielded to the cultural expectations around him. I'm telling you today, that's one of the biggest problems that we have today, that people are being controlled by the culture and not controlled by Christ. We're trying to look like the world, but we're still trying to profess that we're born again. The Bible says, come out from among them, be ye separate. The Bible calls us peculiar people. The Bible refers to us today as different than the, the run of this world because the run of this world is a substandard run. Hallelujah. I know in whom I have believed in and persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know that my God is greater than whatever I can face in life. Amen. So listen, to value cultural form today a norm the cultural norm of life today over the biblical standards of God's word is sin. You're sinning in God's sight. To, to value what the culture around us today values over what the Bible says is blatantly against what God's word declares. So you're sinning. Amen. So this happens today when parents press their kids into success while neglecting godliness in their lives. We want the kids today, our kids, we want them to have all the looks, the feels, the touch, and everything else that the world has. Folks, you don't need that. What you need is the touch of God in your home. What you need for your children is godliness. And let me tell you, they're only going to get it when they see godliness in your life. Come on, church. Are we living godly? Is our families and our homes today reflective of Jesus Christ? Are we living today the, the way that God would have us to live today? Well, the way God wants you to live means that you've got to live down and defeated and out. No, nope, it does not. I don't know who told you that, but they told you a lie. The most blessed people on planet earth are those who have decided to follow Jesus in their lives, in their homes, and they've sold out to Christ. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm not accepting the cultural way. I'm accepting only one way, and that's the Christ way. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> this happens when we look at our kids, and we want them to advance more in life than having godliness or Christ-likeness in their life. The most important thing you can do for your children is to put a godly image before them. Isaac knew what God had said. And you and I too know what God has said in his word. Isaac had his own agenda. Isaac shows that he is bullheaded. And it's a sin to be bullheaded. Second point. It's a sin to be manipulative. Got it out that time. Isaac intended to bless Esau, but Rebekah is not going to have any of that. We got a problem here, Houston. We got a problem in the home. Rebecca's determined and confident. She's strong. She's cunning. She's, she knows. Man, man, she just had the snap about her. When she, when she said something, man, people turned their head and paid attention to her. Rebecca is the prime mover in the family. Well, uh, Isaac, yeah, he wore the pants. In the family, but it was Rebecca that tells him which pair to put on. <laughs> Rebecca is manipulative. She basically takes advantage of Isaac, who is basically blind and can't see. So she's got this thing all mapped out. Rebecca comes up with the plan, and she tricks Isaac on the food, and she also tricks Isaac on the sun. <laughs> What's happened to Rebecca? I mean, she and Isaac used to be a team. They used to be the couple with the community. They used to be in the church and serving the Lord. They used to be on fire for God. They used to be an example of what's happened to Isaac and Rebecca. What's happened to us? Why have we lost our zeal and our enthusiasm and our desire to serve God? They were the model couple. They were the storybook romance. Huh. Stop 
something broke, something fell apart, something happened. That's what happens when you get your eyes off of God. So they did what so many couples did. They took their attention off of each other and placed their attention on themselves. You're in trouble if you do that. And I'm going to tell you, that's what's happened in so many marriages. We want to have it our way. No, it's not you having it your way or he or she having it their way. It's y'all having it God's way. And if you're leaving God out of the equation of your marriage, your marriage is not going to be very good. Bottom line. Anyway, they have their favorite child. Rebecca has hers, Jacob. Isaac has his, Esau. So Rebecca's problem is not her strong and vibrant personality. It's not her confidence. It's not her ability to lead. Rebecca's problem is she lacks trust. Could that be your problem today? You're not trusting God? She, she doesn't trust that God is going to do what God said he will do. See, when you start trying to circumvent God in your life and you're trying to go a different direction and you're trying to take things in control, I'm going to tell you right now, you're headed for a disaster. Just doing it God's way doesn't mean it's always going to be smooth. As a matter of fact, you're going to have rough places and hard places and dark places and, and mountainous terrain and you're going to have some deep valleys and you're going to have some things to go through. But there's a God in heaven that will bring you through through whatever you encounter, face, or ever whatever you will face in life. Our God is able to deliver. Amen. So Rebecca formulates and she's going to help God. God doesn't need your help. He doesn't need your advice. God knows what he's doing. Amen. So Rebecca... Is that whatever it takes kind of girl. Whatever it takes. The problem is you can't do the right thing the wrong way. Amen. You can't do, you can't do the right thing the wrong way. So, third point is, it's a sin to be rebellious. Well, I'm not rebellious. If you're not living by God's will, you are. Amen. Not a lot of good could be said about Esau. Esau was famous for selling his birthright to his brother Jacob and then blaming his brother for it. He, he liked the blame game. Esau is married. He's married to two pagan women. Whew. He doesn't care about religious tradition. He doesn't care about family tradition. He doesn't care about anything but one, and that's himself. So Esau will do what he wants to do any way he wants to do it. So brother, let me tell you what. Any way you, any way you chart that, it all comes out with one thing. It's rebellion against God. Esau got, he got emotional about the blessing. And I, I tell you, folks, let me tell you something. Tears and emotions won't save you. It's grace that saves you. Tears and emotions will not get you to where God wants you. But if you will submit to the God of heaven today, he will direct your paths and lead you in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So here it is. Esau is a tragic figure of rebellion. Number four, it's a sin to be fake. You ever, make fake, fake, you ever meet fake people? Cynthia had, she had such a keen eye for discernment. But I tell you, she could cut right through it. She could cut. She knew the fakes from the real. Amen. Jacob is a disappointment in this story. Verse 18, he begins, he begins his lying. The, con, the convincer is found in Genesis 27 and 26. And his father Isaac said unto him, come now near and kiss me, my son. You know, that kind of sounds familiar to me. Let's go to the garden. The garden of Gethsemane. Remember the kiss of betrayal? By Judas, Isaac was betrayed by a kiss. Jesus was betrayed by a kiss from Judas Iscariot. Lying, betrayal. It seems like that's the course of mankind these days. Yes, Jacob is the chosen one, and from him will come the one we know as Jesus, the Messiah. Wait a minute, preacher. How does all this come about? Hang with me for about two more minutes. Right now in Genesis 27, he's a fake. He's as false as a fellow said as a $3 bill. So it would take what happened in Genesis, you go forward, 32, 
for God to change him. But I'm glad you remember the wrestling match? <laughs> and he says, I'm not letting go until you bless me indeed. Amen. Folks, let me tell you, God will bless you when you surrender to him. God will bless you when you put him first. Seek first the kingdom of God. His righteousness today. Where do you fit in the story today, friend? Where's your position? What's your role in the story today? The point of the story is this. is to get your eyes off of you and get your eyes on God. And if you don't have your eyes on God, you're in the wrong direction. Now, there are two things this story tells us about God. One, God's word is infallible. His word has never failed. His word is absolute truth because God cannot lie. Amen. So what God says is going to happen in the Bible, it's going to happen. Let me tell you, something's about to happen. <laughs> something's about to happen. Something is about to occur. One day, and I believe soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. One day, there's going to be a rapture shout. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, we comfort one another with these words. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am there, you may be also. What does all that mean? It means today he's coming, friend. And you better be ready. That's the sovereign will of God. It cannot be altered. It cannot be changed. It cannot be manipulated. Nothing can change that will of God. His word is infallible. What God said is going to happen, it's going to happen. Then God's word is unstoppable. You cannot stop what God's going to do. No one can stand against God's will today. God's will will be done in spite of of our opposition. And when God makes a plan, his purpose will never fail. Now understand, God has a purpose and a plan for you today. Just before I give you the closing points, I'm drawn to Romans 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, listen to this, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. That's what you need. That's what I need today. So you need a theology that says God is bigger than anything I'll ever face. And that's the theology of this, the word of God. So God's grace is unthinkable. God's perfect will is accomplished today through flawed people. Welcome to the human race. Thank you and welcome to God's plan for your life. We are flawed, but God works through our flaws. Don't tell God your imperfections. Just ask him to forgive you of them. Amen. And then the gospel of Jesus is the theme of the entirety of the Bible. Jesus comes from the line of Jacob. Isn't that amazing? He comes from a line that is flawed, but he comes flawless. He comes in the perfection of the Godhead. He comes and he brings salvation. He comes and he brings hope. He comes and he brings everything that is needed in your life and mine today. Thank God Jesus takes on the fullness of man's wickedness today and being born from the wretchedness line, the wretched line of Jacob today, he declares, and this is what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We have to see Jesus today who is fully righteous today who will take your flaws forgive your sins and give you his favor Amen. hallelujah Amen. Amen praise God it's all in receiving by faith through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ what God has for you today in Jesus God's grace is greater 
greater than your flaws, greater than all your blunders, greater than all your sin, greater than all your bad decisions, greater than all your mess ups, greater than your messed up family, greater than anything messed up in this world. Our God is greater, amen, and his grace is sufficient. Would you bow your heads for a moment? You can confess your sins and receive his favor today. His forgiveness. You can receive eternal life. Pastor Carlton, I don't know him as my personal savior. I've never invited this Jesus into my life. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to drag you to an altar. I'm not going to beat you up. I'm not going to do anything that would offend you in any way. I just want to know how I can pray for you today. Preach it up. I don't know Jesus is my personal Savior. Rather than raising your hand, let's do something even better than that. Let's pray a prayer. Let's give you the opportunity of calling out unto the Lord and asking him to come into your heart and your life. If you don't know Christ, if you don't know today with certainty that you have salvation, would you pray this prayer with your heart and mean it with your life today? Dear God in heaven, in Jesus' name, I know that Jesus died for me on the cross. I know that he paid my sin debt. Forgive me, God, of my sin of rejecting you. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Save me right now. Make me your child. Thank you, Lord, for saving me today. In Jesus' name, before you lift your head, I'm going to ask you to do one thing. Now this is the place you raise your hand. If you asked Christ to come into your heart and your life a moment ago, I just want to know so I can pray for you. I won't do nothing to hurt you. I just want to know so I can pray for you. If you just ask Christ into your life, just slip your hand up, slip it back down right now. Anyone? Anyone this morning? Jesus, I asked Jesus into my life. And today is my day of redemption. Hallelujah. And I'm not ashamed to declare I'm now a child of the King. Now, how about your life today? In your dysfunction and in your flaws God has a will for you. And whatever that will is today, you've got to come pursuing it. And I'm going to tell you, these altars are open to you. Would you stand to your feet right now? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that that, uh, that spirit of God will just fall on us right now. That God, we will want to live lives that are pleasing to you. We desire your favor. But Lord, for the favor to come, we've got to decide right now if we will come and say, Lord, in all my flaws and all the things of my life that's wrong, forgive me and God direct me and God lead me and God help me. And Lord, you promise that you would do all of that and even more. Now, Father, I just pray that our hearts will be softened and we will come to altars. Maybe there are struggles that folks are going through. Maybe direction they need. Maybe they need help and hope today. Everything can be found. Maybe they need a healing. Everything can be found right here in Christ today. Help us to come. Would you come today as we have a song? Would you come today and let God move on your heart as he desires? Would you come and say, God, I want your will in my life. I want you to dominate my life. I want you to lead my life. I want you to guide my life. Come on, folks. There's an altar open today, and there's arms of heaven today that are open and says, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Come on. Come on.